wow, that's really expensive, but it tastes like garbage. If it tastes like garbage, why are you going, ah, <laughs> well, it's not refreshing, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Hmm, this is really expensive tea that tastes like garbage. Kind of like everything Sam Levinson makes. Because Sam Levinson is mid. That is my take today. Sam Levinson is mediocre and I'm going to tell you why. If you don't know, Sam Levinson is a writer-director and he got famous for creating the first season of Euphoria, infamous for the second season of Euphoria, and then notorious for the widely maligned The Idol. So my take isn't much of a hot take now, but back in 2019, it would have been steamy because the first season of Euphoria hit the internet like a storm. The makeup was groundbreaking, the costuming was amazing, the cinematography was super dynamic, all the makeup gurus did all of the looks on YouTube, Zendaya won a much deserved Emmy. But when you look at that show within a larger portfolio of Sam Levinson's work, the cracks start to show and patterns start to emerge. So the original concept of this video was to do something like the seven deadly sins of Sam Levinson, or I watched all of Sam Levinson's work so you don't have to, which I kind of did. And basically I just clown on what he's made and it's really easy to do that. But in doing so, I unearthed something darker and it led to a broader theme or opinion I have on Hollywood and the industry as a whole. But first, Let's clown on Sam Levinson's work. <laughs> Having some audio issues, we're now including the line in headphones, but I hear it's trendy because Bella Hadid wears these, so I'm actually cool. First up is Operation Endgame, a terrible spy action comedy that Sam Levinson wrote all the way back in 2010, where every character talks like a nine-year-old edgelord. Glad to see menopause hasn't affected your mood. Yeah, he is just, he's endearingly retarded. Our fearless protagonist is constantly asking questions because the plot makes no sense. Am I replacing somebody or are all you guys uh, named after tarot cards? Well, what does Alpha do? And what about us, Omega? What's the need for any of it? Don't you guys just negate each other? I mean, what, what does she do here anyway? Uh, so what happens if that door malfunctions? How do we get out? Have you ever visited a Chinatown section in a major city? Okay, so I'm gonna try to tell you the plot of Operation Endgame. There are two spy teams. They're all in this place called the factory. As of this moment, you're officially hired by the factory. Factory, an elite espionage cell ostensibly unacknowledged by the US government and staffed by unofficial covert operatives. And then the factory starts to shut down. And when the factory shuts down, it's gonna explode. He activated Project Endgame. I'm sorry, what? Why would the bomb be on a timer when the whole place is locked down and nobody can get out? What about the surveillance tapes? Well, can we disarm it? Well, what would it be? How many fucking questions are you gonna ask? All the spies are trying to figure out who shut down the factory, and in doing so, they're all assassinating each other. Who would win a fight between you and me? And the factory is about to explode at the end. They have all these clips of George Bush and Barack Obama for some reason. I have no fucking idea why. Yeah, so that's the plot of Operation Endgame. Saved you two hours of time. God right. damn it! If there's an exit or a way ah. out. Next up, we have Another Happy Day, which Sam Levinson wrote and directed. Full creative control there. Didn't want anyone else involved in that film. Right off the bat, it's impossible to find this movie online, so I own this trash on DVD now. It's really hard to clown on this movie because it's so needlessly dark and in really poor taste. There's a lot of dark movies out there and often they have something more to say or there's an intellectual message. You know, did you ever think of the Yakumo point of view that we might be the ones who are savages? <laughs> this film, it feels like someone wanted to make an edgy family drama and they're just trying to go to 100 because in this particular family drama, Ellen Barkin has to go to a wedding where her ex-husband will be in attendance. This ex-husband physically abused her and then groomed and sexually abused their daughter. I think what Sam was trying to go for was a Rachel getting married where a wedding brings out all of the family trauma. In Rachel getting married, the trauma is where no one is at fault for it. It's something that happened and the family's like analyzing that in retrospect. In Another Happy Day, there's a very obvious villain and he's running around free as a bird. So I don't know why Ellen Barkin is here 
here. I don't know why she hasn't cut ties with her family. The whole concept of the movie just like doesn't make sense. And you can't make fun of it because then you're making fun of like child abuse. Now we're in 2016 with Assassination Nation, another writer director credit. I think the pitch for this movie was The Purge meets Virgin Suicides. Does that sound like it would make sense? Guess what? It doesn't. So the catalyst of this film is leaked nudes and then the town's called Salem. Guess what? They go crazy. And they start to target these women in a very violent way. Violence and sexual assault are very real traumas that happen to real people. Sam just throws it in there. It's just like another thing. And the way that he frames these people taking back their life is so surface level feminism of them turning into ninjas. It's a societal systemic problem you can't just beat it by becoming a ninja. Like, I don't know what message that sends. And then on top of this, him being like a straight white man who's a Nepo baby, it's like he has no connection to these communities that he's portraying these acts of violence against. So it feels like it's just purely for shock value. And when something is purely for shock value, just to get eyeballs on your like trauma porn, it is exploitative. So that's my main problem with Assassination Nation. After Assassination Nation, we get into the euphoria era which is getting into a standard deviation of good but after watching all that garbage you can really see how sam dragged his lazy storytelling habits into the writing and directing of euphoria the frustrating thing about euphoria is that it really relies on performances and because the actors are so good the performances do sell it however upon rewatch the thing that sticks out to me the most is how messy the writing is the plots are so hastily resolved often just dropped characters don't have art they don't really change or grow. Things are just happening. Nate is probably one of the more comical examples where he is a jock and he's kind of portrayed in a sympathetic light. You're meant to feel bad for like the toxic masculinity he's trapped in. But two episodes later, he's like the Joker. It's like, who is this guy? Another great example of this is the character of Kat, whose whole arc is sexually coming into her own. In the course of three episodes, we see her go from an insecure virgin to an online dominatrix who takes pain payment from old men over the internet to punish them. And it's like, we didn't want to see that over the course of a season. I feel like that's an eight episode arc and it just happens. And then she's just hanging out for the rest of the season. Like she has nothing left to do. And of course, to do this, she has to have a makeover because this is a show written by a man and there's got to be a makeover scene if a girl's coming into her own. Let's talk about Jules's nudes, the messiest plot line in the history of television. A few minutes later. But then, but then Nate's dad though with his, but he has his disc with Jules recorded on it, remember? A little longer than a few minutes later. I can try to say it again and just like, I'm just trying to keep it as short as possible. Okay, well, I think I can edit it. Okay. Let me just say it. Let me just say everything. One eternity later recorded this eight times. I'm trying to explain this plot line. So Jules is a new girl in town. She has a one night stand with McSteamy. McSteamy records all of his sexual encounters and Jules is underage. So this is obviously a problem. Meanwhile, Nate starts to catfish Jules romantically as Tyler. We have no idea why. Jules has completely fallen in love with Tyler and it seems that Nate might have feelings for her as well. So at this point, I'm like, oh, this is a really cool conflict. Nate almost beat her up at a party earlier and he's very image focused. So then we get to the end of episode four. They're about to meet up in the middle of the night and I'm thinking, ooh, like Nate's gonna confess his love to her. But no, that doesn't happen at all. So then he reveals that as Tyler, he's been collecting her nudes in order to blackmail her because she had a one night stand with his father and he doesn't want her to snitch out his father to the police, which is cuckoo bananas because Jules doesn't even care about McSteamy anymore. I have no intention of like hurting you or anything. If she does that, then he will release her nudes, just open online, and then she will be convicted of child pornography. So that's how that plot line ends. Mid-season. <laughs> this disc of Jules having sex with McSteamy is sprinkled throughout the rest of season one and two. It just kind of appears and disappears. And then it's kind of resolved in episode six, where Nate meets up with Jules in the middle of the night and then just gives her the disc and is like, bye. But then at the finale of season two, Nate decides that he's actually going to give the videotape to the police and get his dad arrested because he's mad at his dad. I just want revenge. 
This is a prime example of how Sam's writing feels so first draft. It doesn't feel like anything is set up and paid off. It feels like they didn't know what to do with this conflict they created. After a very messy season of television, we get to Malcolm and Marie, which is supposed to be the dissection of an artist couple's relationship. Sam decides to use that movie to talk about the issues that black people face. You can't say that I brilliantly subverted this trope because I'm black, but I fell into this one because I'm a fucking man. It's very grating because it's just two people yelling at each other the entire time. And then it ends in classic Sam Levinson fashion. They're just standing outside in a field, I guess. The movie's ended, it's done. <laughs> Nothing has been resolved. Malcolm and Marie was super boring and annoying. Awesome. Okay, so now we're at Euphoria season two. So a child hits McSteamy four times in the head with a shotgun. Don't ask. So McSteamy is now ambling around with a comically large head bandage that no one acknowledges. Then he goes to a gay bar and starts to wrestle the patrons. And the owner of the bar literally says, I warned you like 10 fucking times not to wrestle anybody you didn't fucking listen like it's an i think you should leave sketch i didn't do fucking shit then mcsteamy walks through the front door of his home does a pee pee on the floor and starts to ramble on about his family and how they're all fucked up because they watch porn and stuff and the way the scene is framed is that the family is literally staring down on him like they're disappointed in him but he has this head injury and this huge bandage it's like has he gone to the hospital does anyone care like like it's so unwarranted and so weirdly framed. And of course his dick is out because Sam was bored with his own scene. He grabs a family photo and then leaves. And then he doesn't show up until the finale of the second season with a new sex crew and he's getting arrested for having sex with a minor. That's the story of McSteamy. All right, let's talk about Rue. Rue is our protagonist. Rue relapses at the end of season one and she continues to spiral throughout season two. The height of her drug addiction is episode five of season two and she gets involved in a very dangerous situation with a high level drug dealer. Rue. If you screw me, I'll have you kidnapped and sold to some real sick people. She is clean by episode six, and then episode seven and eight, she is just hanging out in an audience, literally passively watching a play. That whole drug dealer thing, completely unresolved. And her last speech of the series is this. I stayed clean through the rest of the school year. I wish I could say that was a decision I made. Somehow Palpatine returned. It is so hack and first draft, it is actually mind boggling. In the last two episodes of a television show, your protagonist should be doing all of the things. They should be at the climax of their story, not in an audience making reaction faces. Alrighty, now we have Deep Water. To be fair, Sam only co-wrote this one. Deep Water is about Ben Affleck, who is a serial killer. And you know that from the second scene, which is great. The thing about mysteries is that usually you have to withhold information, but you know, that's just a guideline. The weird thing about Deep Water is that there's a lot of party scenes, a lot of people drinking at rich people's houses. There's a saying that movies are life with all the boring parts cut out. That is not the philosophy of Deep Water. You know, I got a job in New Mexico. It's a good one. It pays well. Yeah, so I've been working on uh, building lead certified housing. Oh. Yeah. And he's my teacher. I am. Okay. The snails aren't for eating. The snails are not for eating. Deep Water ends, like all great noirs do, with a high stakes chase on a mountain bike where Ben Affleck wins because he knows a shortcut. Like this is an episode of Stranger Things. Ever gone mountain biking? And last and certainly least, we have The Idol, which is less of a television show and more of an assembly of expensive footage. The Idol is a classic case of where do we even start? The nonsensical plot, the exploitative sex scenes, the weekend's terrible acting. I almost said Drake. <laughs> Could you imagine if Drake was in this? My favorite part is the end. The gang has to get together to sell the concert to the concert man, and they decide to put on some sort of review where they all sing and dance in their underwear. Imagine this on a fucking stage. Imagine this on a fucking stage. It's chill. I too have done drugs and white girl dance, but I didn't think I could charge anyone $200 to go see it. But now that I have an OnlyFans, ba, ba, boom. I don't. Ha! That's the joke. But it can't be that good because these assholes keep yammering. It's like Sam was worried we'd get bored watching very talented people sing and dance. 
Or, you know, she is incredible. Do you know who else was really talented? Charles Manson. You know what else he did? He moved into Dennis Wilson's house and lived there for a year and a half. They tell him to tear the walls and stuff. They tell him to lie to Biden's house. Shut the fuck up. The Idol is the culmination of Sam Levinson's worst habits as a storyteller. It's all shock value, it's mean, it's bleak, and worst of all... It could be worse. How? It could be boring. This is pretty fucking boring. Fifth day of filming, which calls for another background color. It's red because I'm in a hell of my own creation. So let's keep this train rolling to the next part of the video, which is me complimenting Sam. In my opinion, the best thing Sam has ever made are the two special episodes of Euphoria in between season one and two. The writing is very moving, the performances are amazing. The first special episode covers Rue and how she's spiraling in her drug addiction. She's meeting with her sponsor on Christmas Eve. And shout out to Coleman Domingo in this episode. He's absolutely incredible. You don't know shit. You think you're hard? I'm harder. You think you're tough? I'm tougher. You got clean and went to kill yourself? Same motherfucking story here. You wanna know why? You wanna know why? I'll tell you why. Cause you don't know how to live life. The second episode profiles Jules and her conflict as a trans woman and how she really craves validation on her femininity from heterosexual men and how that's gotten her into a lot of trouble. It's a very experimental and abstract episode. Sam actually uses sex, nudity, and the performer's physicality to tell a story rather than just male gaze at his hot actress's titties, which is a nice change. Hunter Schaefer is a trans woman and also co-wrote that episode. It feels like something I haven't seen before and is very authentic. But then after those two special episodes, we have season two of Euphoria, Deep Water, and The Idol, and I feel like we're on the express train to lazy storytelling land again. You gotta have balls. I've got balls. You got balls. I got balls. While we're complimenting Sam, I will say that his visuals are very distinct and striking. And when I talk about visuals, I'm not saying his visual storytelling. He's very good at photographing moments. Individual moments in Euphoria look incredible, but it's when you need to put all those moments together into scenes where his work really falls apart. It looks beautiful, but it doesn't follow a clear narrative path. You've been thinking a lot about our relationship because you have a, you have a terminal brain disorder. Another thing that I admire about Sam, which no one else will probably care about, is how he's working to keep the format of film alive. It's annoying that Malcolm and Marie is so boring because it's a great looking film. For the second season of Euphoria, Sam worked with Kodak to revive 35mm Ektachrome, which is like an unheard of accomplishment. For the mess that season two is, it's so beautiful, retro, and dreamy, and really captures the memory of high school. But the problem with having pretty pictures and service of mediocre writing is that it's not much different from a director of photography's demo reel. I wonder if Sam's talents would be better used in art direction or cinematography rather than writing and directing. So the original plan was to end it here. I made fun of all of Sam Levinson's terrible movies. You laughed, I cried, and you go on to the next YouTube video. However, I think who Sam Levinson is and what he represents within the Hollywood infrastructure makes it difficult to write a straightforward commentary video. I can completely understand someone having a few duds at the beginning of their career, but when you compare Operation Endgame or Another Happy Day to The Idol, I don't see much change in overall quality of the writing and directing. I see a lot more money, I see a lot more beautiful cinematography, but the base plot and tone and all that important stuff has not improved. And Sam has the luxury of not having to get better at his craft because he is the son of legendary Hollywood director and producer, Barry Levinson. And in my opinion, if you took away Sam's money and connections, his work in its rawest form isn't much better than what you'd see from Tommy Wiseau or Neil Breen. And it's definitely not as fun. I'm feeling less stable. And it gets even more sinister when you look into Sam's working style. Petra Collins is a Canadian photographer who became famous in the 2010s from her photography series, most of which got famous on Tumblr. Sam Levinson hired Petra Collins for pre-production of Euphoria. Petra Collins had previously worked with Hunter Schaefer, Alexa Demi, and Zendaya, Petra Collins also made a short film with Barbie Fiera in 2016, and they thought that her photography style would really suit the tone of Euphoria. 
For some reason, after five months, she was mysteriously fired and found out they continued with her vision when she saw advertising for the show a year later. Just to clarify, no one officially stole from anyone. These are all allegations. I want to reference another video essay here called Stealing Girlhood, the Legacy of Women's Work Being Stolen. This YouTuber takes pictures that Petra Collins made in a photography series called 24 Hour Psycho, where Petra Collins photographed women in close up with neon lighting, glitter on their face and crying. That's a image we now associate with euphoria, but Petra Collins was doing it all the way in 2016. So uh, this YouTuber took um, images from that series and compared it with stills from euphoria. I'll put the stills here and you can make a decision on what happened. And then it happened again with Amy Simons on The Idol. According to this Rolling Stone article, Amy Simons was brought on as a director for The Idol and had completed 80% of the show at a cost of nearly $75 million when Sam Levinson, who originally was the executive producer, swooped in and took over writing and directing and completely reshot the whole show. This article alleges that Amy Simons in The Weeknd had a conflict because Amy Simons brought too much of a female perspective to the story. We don't want our Britney Spears and inspired pop star diva story to have too much of a female perspective. And by the way, Petra Collins isn't in the credits for Euphoria and Amy Simons isn't in the credits for The Idol. So what is actually happening here? And this behavior started all the way back in 2010 with Operation Endgame. The original screenwriter, Brian Watanabe, wrote a feature length script and submitted it to screenplay contests. And that's how he got traction with it and eventually sold it. And then for some reason, Sam Levinson was brought in by someone to change the plot and tone of the film entirely. They hired a new screenwriter. They basically had a different take on the material. What was basically an, you know, an office satire. They kind of turned into a little bit more of a political satire, but you know, all in all, you know, it was a little bittersweet. And I think that's one thing you, you have to learn as a screenwriter is like once they pay for your script, it's pretty much out of your hands. And not for the better because the plot is incomprehensible. Oh my God. That fucking cat, okay. <laughs> oh my god. And not for the better, because the writing of that movie is convoluted and corny as hell. Way to welcome the new boy, asshole. I was gonna let the walls of your vagina do that. <laughs> And what is mind boggling about this whole thing is that Brian said that Sam changed the script to be more of a political satire, but you just can't throw in clips of Barack Obama and George Bush at the end of your movie and call it a political satire. That's not enough. There's a point to satire. It's not fucking Animal Farm. It's just out of context clips of George Bush and Obama. My point is Sam has a history of co-opting the work of lesser known creators, remaking it as his own, and then selling himself as the singular creative brainchild. And we haven't even gotten into how he runs his sets. Reports from multiple news outlets about lack of preparation, animosity between crew members, actors walking off set, actors having issues with nudity, and regular all-nighters, which are against union guidelines, by the way, so they actually had to get involved. All of this drama on sets that cost tens of millions to hundreds of millions of dollars. These should be spaces of utmost professionalism. And I can't help but wonder how we got here. Before Euphoria, Sam was a key creative on three films, Operation Endgame, Another Happy Day, and Assassination Nation. All reviewed poorly, and it's not like they made any money. Assassination Nation lost $4.1 million and was considered the worst box office opening of that year. So here we have someone with a terrible filmography, treats his crew like shit, and doesn't even make any money. Why do we keep giving this guy projects? Why is he getting season three of Euphoria? Can't we give it to someone else? Do you have someone in mind? Ari Aster. <laughs> I was thinking that too. Imagine if Ari Aster did Euphoria. I'd watch the shit out of that. And while we're talking about exploiting other people's labor, let's talk about Sydney Sweeney. Sydney Sweeney plays Cassie on Euphoria, and she is a great actress. She spends all of season two scantily clad and crying. <laughs> Sydney was interviewed by The Hollywood Reporter in 2022, where she talks openly about her pay and how she can't keep up with the cost of living in Hollywood. When this article came out, she was lambasted by the internet. Look at this big boob rich lady talking about how she doesn't make any money. There are all these other people with less money and smaller boobs. She should be grateful. Lisa, I want some more. 
when you actually read the article, Cindy Sweeney isn't complaining as much as she's describing what it's like to live in Los Angeles without a safety net. Cindy Sweeney is from a lower middle class family in Spokane, Washington. Her family sold their home to jumpstart her acting career. When she first moved to LA, she slept in a motel room with her entire family. By the time she was 18 years old, she only had $800 to her name and the whole experience broke up her parents' marriage. So here we have Cindy Sweeney bringing her A-game to a million projects and doing Instagram deals on the side just to make it work. Meanwhile, we have Sam Levinson over here, Hollywood royalty, phoning it in for these huge projects, treating his crew like shit, and underpaying one of his main actresses to the point where she has to take a million different brand deals in order to pay her mortgage. And you know what? He doesn't have to worry about it because he's Barry Levinson's son. He just bought an $8 million home in Beverly Hills. Why is the industry propping up this Nepo baby while people like Sydney Sweeney work their butt off and other folks like Amy Simitz, Brian Watanabe, and Petra Collins get their work co-opted and then they're cast to the side. Sam has proven time and time again he doesn't make good work and he's not a good guy to work for. And after a long day of directing women to pose in nude selfies, writing situations of violence for trans women, or picking out humiliating outfits for Sydney Sweeney, he can't even be bothered to uplift the artists he's stealing from because he's too busy being a narcissistic prick at press conferences. When my wife read me the article, I just said, I think we're about to have the biggest show of the summer. <laughs> <laughs> Sam should thank Daddy Levinson for setting up this incredible life for him. Fuck you, Sam, and I'm done. Anyway, I feel like this video is super depressing, so I have a movie recommendation for you. Go watch The Holdovers. It's a super cozy Christmas movie. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I saw it in theaters. Go watch it today. Also, like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, follow me on Instagram, all that other stuff. I'll see you later because I can't even think anymore. Bye.